Hello, and welcome to the Allen Press webinar, Tactics for Increasing the Speed of Publication. I'm Taylor Fulton, Senior Marketing Manager at Allen Press, and I will be your host today. On your screen, you should see some general information about participating in this webinar. I'm going to go over a few of these features before our presenters get started. First off, we'll be answering all questions at the end of the webinar. If you have questions, just click on the questions box on the main menu sidebar and type in your message. If you are having technical difficulties, please use the questions feature to contact us and we will try to assist you. Finally, if you are having trouble hearing, please call in and listen to the webinar over the conference line. The toll-free telephone number and participant passcode for the conference line are listed in the audio section of the main menu. Just click on the phone call radio button and the call credential should appear on your screen. Today, Alan Press's Beverly Lynn Dean and Kristen Anderson will share best practices for improving the speed of journal publication. Beverly Lynn Dean has been in the scholarly publishing business for 19 years, dating back to her days as a proofreader in 1998. Prior to joining Alan Press, Beverly received a bachelor's degree in English language and literature from the University of Kansas. Since then, she's worked with dozens of society publishers as both an editorial account manager and senior managing editor. Beverly is a dedicated member of a number of professional organizations and is currently the board director for the International Society of Managing and Technical Editors, where she also serves as the board liaison for the nominations committee and is the chair of the website committee. She also volunteers on the Council of Science Editors Program Committee and is on the editorial board for Science Editor Journal. Outside of the office, Beverly enjoys cooking and baking and is also an obsessive and quite talented knitter. Our second presenter is Kristen Anderson. Kristen is also a managing editor here at Allen Press and started her career as a proofreader in 2007. Like Beverly, Kristen has worked with a number of scientific and academic society publishers and is a member of Council of Science Editors, International Society of Managing and Technical Editors, and Society for Scholarly Publishing. Kristen earned a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Bachelor of Science in Journalism, both from the University of Kansas. Kristen, admittedly, has many hobbies, but particularly enjoys cured coffee, nice office furniture, and lots of running. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Beverly and Kristen now as they present tactics for increasing the speed of publication. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for joining us today. Beverly and I are going to make your journal backlog concerns go away, speed up all your processes, and make every single author super happy. Okay, okay, probably a bit too presumptuous, but we really hope to help you. And while I'm sure some of these concepts will be familiar, maybe there are intricate layers that have been missed. As mentioned, our presentation today will give you tactics for increasing the speed of publication, starting in the beginning with peer review, moving all the way through journal production. Let's start at the beginning with the peer review process. I'm hesitant to add express here, but I did, so let me explain. You need to use your peer review platform to the best of its ability, right? By that I mean if you haven't installed auto reminders for lateness, it would be a good idea to start. And try not to leave out a group of people, meaning when there are a set of reminders for reviewers, be sure you include auto, reminder, auto reminders for editors and authors as well. People get busy, and we certainly need reminding. Remember that we're not trying to nag, but words like just a friendly reminder or at your earliest convenience can go far. Although maybe for your group, text and these email notifications can be a bit more aggressive along the lines of within two business days and time is running out. You know your group and you know what they will respond to. I would say if you're one of those groups that is cautious and filling up inboxes, try to move away from that thinking and instead think that you are aiding them and following through. In my role here at Allen Press, I can certainly attest to reminders being helpful. And actually, in a few uh, peer review sites that I manage, for one reason or another, a series of reminders haven't gotten out. And when I finally touch base with them, their response is usually, I'm used to getting reminders from peer review sites, and when I didn't get them, I didn't think my review was needed, so I moved on. 
again, the point here, just think that you're being helpful rather than annoying. And actually, getting back to not getting your email, let me add that while I say automate these because, well, we want to take away from reminding yourself about reminders, I think we all know automation can fail. Know your site, your links, and your fol folders very well. Remember that we need to go in daily to ensure functionality is, well, functioning. If there's a breakdown in communication, jump on it quickly. Papers and peer review should not sit longer than they have to. Your reviewers and editors know this too, of course. But I think sometimes expectations are overlooked and just demanded. If you make these volunteers aware of what is expected of them, you will get more of what you want. After all, yes, they are volunteers. And like us all, they are pulled in several directions. If we are clear and direct with our reviewers and editors, you will see progression in turnaround times, thoughtful reviews, and appropriate de decisions. Re-review your notices that go out when a reviewer accepts or say when an editor takes on an associate editor role for the paper. Are they getting the important steps? Are they needing instructions on how to work through the peer review process? And is the deadline clear enough? If this is the case, but maybe you're still not seeing expectations met, you may want to consider sending out a blast email that checks in with your colleagues. Drop them a note and include text such as, while we know you're busy, we hope that you take a few minutes to read through our updated expectations for your role in our site. And bulleted lists are, of course, helpful. I wanted to mention educational programs. I attended the CSC meeting in May and found the new initiatives to training editors, reviewers, and authors presentation quite interesting. It spoke to educational programs for reviewers more specifically. A reviewer programming project was initiated at PLOS, and while yes, we remember they are volunteers, most of the reviewers that went through this short educational program found it helpful instead of daunting. On the journal side, they also started to see more consistent types of reviewer feedback. Again, just going to expectations here, it, it set the bar, and it aided in obtaining high-level peer reviews. They also spoke to reviewing a review, meaning you set up some sort of scoring, um, scoring system or a grading scale, and then you designate who is going to review the review. Feedback. Just remember to give the feedback to the reviewer. So at this point, you may be thinking, um, this managing editor is supposed to tell me how to decrease time. An educational program sounds like a lot of work to get started. And this is very true. But the thinking is if you get thorough reviews the first time around, then the author knows exactly what to do, edits accordingly, sends it back to peer review, and we're good to go. If everything can be covered in the first round of revisions, then maybe second and third revisions can be eliminated. Consider giving some time to a training model to save you time in the peer review process. I'm paraphrasing what the PLOS representative said, but I thought it was a really nice perspective. She said reviewers have the mentality to give back to their community of work, so run with that and remember what benefits they can bring. They do indeed. So let's not waste their time or anyone else's for that matter. I'm sure all of you have already some sort of quality check or a technical check or the let's filter out distraction step. Most sites are designed to have this already. But just be sure you are weeding out disruptive elements. You want the content to be the focus, nothing else. If you have a word limit, check that up front. If you have an article type layout, check that up front. If there are tables, check that they are all mentioned in the article text and so on. You don't want to get too involved with this, but I think there are certainly basic level elements that can be scrutinized and fixed, or of course sent back to the author to fix. Speaking of the author, the flip side to this is you don't want a huge list of checkpoints. Again, you want the submissions moving along, and it starts with this step. As soon as they hit the site, run a quality check step and get it moving. Like a car driving off the lot, authors tend to think their paper is, sitting, is losing value the longer it sits. Then, maybe consider at the revision stage checking for a few more items. In theory, you're seeing a revised version, so in theory, acceptance might be closer. So maybe you check that, say, references are in alphabetical order, if that is your journal style, or that maybe references are cited in numerical order. Can we check resolution of figures at this stage? Again, just maybe consider a few more elements to the paper that can be addressed up front so that when it does get accepted, production processes are not, are not held up. 
So in going back to those two examples, say in copulating, it can get held up for when you're asking for entire renumbering of references. Or in figure processing, uh, they determine the figures are too low quality to print. And hey, if you cover such elements in your author instructions and authors read them, <laughs> then we are cruising. I wanted to briefly um, touch on author instructions. Be sure you cover the details, but be as concise and thorough as possible. In my experience, hyperlinked instructions are very helpful. We probably feel a lot of our time is wasted scrolling and scrolling on a computer screen. With hyperlinked instructions, though, you can skip around as necessary. So I know we all know what hyperlink means, but I wanted to show an example here. So the example shows clicking the hyperlink short communications article type on the left side, which then takes you directly to the short communication section. Even though this shown document is 13 pages, which may seem long or short to you, it still saves time and time. That's what we want to do here. And we want to do that for your authors, too. And post your author instructions wherever possible. Link out from your society page, your peer review site. Again, you just, you just want to make them visible and available as possible. You don't want an author having to go from one site to another if it isn't necessary. So think express. How am I ensuring all time is tightened? You know, it's hard not to look toward turnaround times. Um, so our reviewers allow too much time to review. Do editors need shortened schedules to submit their decisions? I'm a little cautious to use Express here at the essentially heart of peer review, particularly since I had mentioned developing an education program and setting expectations. We certainly don't want to take away from quality. Maybe for a short duration, until folks are more acclimated to the new expectations, reviewers might actually need more time to complete a thorough review. You know, Taylor mentioned I like running. If I have, say, 30 minutes to run, I can't necessarily think about mileage that day. Since I only have 30 minutes, maybe my emphasis is form that day. But if I have an hour to run, then maybe I can focus a bit more on how far I go that day, as well as form. Both can be important qualities of a run. I would like to allow, say, a combined hour for both. Same concept for peer review here. If I have, say, five days to review, can I effectively cover all the elements I'm supposed to cover, especially with all the other daily tasks of my day? But if I have 12 days to review, can this give me more time to really give a thorough review, particularly if we're talking about a really long paper? You just want to be cautious where you cut your time. And I think that is especially true, like I said, at the heart of your peer review. So I would advise maybe one time a year to re-review your turnaround times. If a reviewer has 14 days to review, can we shorten that to 10 or 12? Or if an editor has five days to make a recommendation or a de decision, should we maybe shorten that to four? And actually, maybe your editors are feeling too pressured, and they actually need seven days. If you start getting more thorough reviews up front, maybe editors will need more time to go through the reviews more thoroughly on their end. So just a thought here. If you've communicated effectively and set expectations, has your reviewers trained properly, and run through your author instructions for clarity, which I think helps guarantee the quality of the check step goes quickly, although again, be sure you implement a technical check step, then you can maybe assess durations in peer review and see if a slight change can be made in shortening days to review. You want to make sure timelines are strategic and logical rather than having arbitrary deadlines. But enough peer review. Let's get into post-acceptance work. Beverly is going to help us get started. Thank you, Kristen. So let's take a look at how publishing articles ahead of print can increase your speed of publication. So publish ahead of print. Why bother? Well, first thing, faster publication. According to an article in the journal Nature from February to 2016, review time in Nature over a 10-year span has risen from 85 days to 150 days, and in PLOS One, it has risen from 37 days to 125 in the same time period. The length of time spent in review can mean a, that a re researcher's paper could be in review for close to a year, especially if that author shops around to high-impact journals. Publishing an article ahead of print can mean that an author does not have to wait even longer for his or her research to be published once the paper is accepted. Here we have a graph illustrating publication times for the Journal of Oral Implantology. 
In the first three issues of 2017, 33 articles were published. The orange line represents the number of days between submission and print publication for all 33 articles. The blue line represents the number of days between submission and online publication of the accepted raw manuscript. The difference between the two lines represents an average 58% decrease in the number of days to publication, quite a savings in time. Now let's look at who benefits from faster publication. In an article published in Science in 2013, Danielle Finelli, evolutionary biologist at the University of Montreal is quoted as saying, at the moment, the way a career in science works is that you have to get lots of publication. The better the journals you publish in, the more grants, and so on. That's how you make it in science. Researchers working under the publish or perish mentality have to publish often and quickly in order to win additional research dollars for their institutions. And often their advancement at their institutions hinges on frequent publishing, meaning that their ability to obtain tenure is tied to the number of articles they have published. It is to the benefit of publishers to increase speed of publication. Being known as the journal that publishes original research quickly means a journal could start to be seen as the best, re best resource for innovation. This reputation should cause submissions to increase as authors will be drawn to a journal that publishes content quickly. And of course, readers benefit from faster publication because it gives them access to the latest research development. Having this access could potentially change the direction of other scientists' research. There are several version options for publishing articles ahead of print. The first option is posting the article online in its accepted form directly from the peer review system. This version is the raw manuscript. No copy editing or paging has been done at this stage. Some peer review systems can automatically export the metadata and PDF of an article upon acceptance or setting a final disposition. This information could then be ingested by an online publishing platform and indexed in PubMed or other indexers that allow entries for publish ahead of print articles. For instance, at Elm Press, the peer track peer review system exports the metadata and PDF and the Pinnacle online publishing platform posts the article online. It could be that you're not comfortable posting an article online that has not been copy edited. Maybe you have a lot of ESL authors to submit articles that could benefit from a thorough copy edit. Or you might have attempted to shorten review times and ease reviewer burden by asking them to concentrate only on the science and not on the grammar or language. In either of these cases, copy editing the article prior to online posting is another option. If your peer review system has final decision and final disposition as two separate tasks, the copy editing can be done in between these stages. Copy edited files can be uploaded into the system after final decision, final disposition can be set, and the metadata and PDF export can be completed. Alternatively, you can provide the copy edited file to your online vendor for posting to the online publishing platform after acceptance. Maybe you want the published ahead of print version of an article to look like it will when it's published in the print journal. If so, you could choose to post the page proofs in PDF form. There are a couple of options for paged versions that could be used for online posting. The first of these options is the first proofs. The first proof is usually the version that is sent to the author and editors for review. Copy editing has been completed and figures are in place on the page, as are the tables. With the exception of any minor corrections requested by the author or editors after their review, the article is close to its published form. The second option is to post the revised proofs. If you would like the author's and editor's feedback to be incorporated into the online version, then you can publish the revised version of the page proofs. Whether changes are minor or major, they will be incorporated before the article is posted online. Another publish ahead of print option is continuous publication, and Kristen will cover this option in detail later in our presentation. While the goal of publishing ahead of print is to speed up publication, there are some challenges and drawbacks to consider. One of the drawbacks of posting an article ahead of print directly from the peer review system is that there may be grammar or language errors. Typos are likely. The goal of peer review is to evaluate the science presented, and grammar is often pushed to the back burner. Reviewers volunteer their time to thoroughly review the scientific and or statistical elements of a paper and do not necessarily have time to correct grammar. Or they could be instructed by the editor-in-chief to ignore grammar or punctuation errors. 
The assumption is that the paper will be submitted to the journal as a readily understandable narrative, and any grammar or language mistakes will be taken care of during the production process. This means that publishing ahead of print articles will most likely be posted online with grammar and language mistakes. I would also like to note that the information that appears in the online table of contents for publish ahead of print articles is often derived from the metadata of the article, which comes from the submission form that the author filled out when submitting the article for review. If the article has made any typos while filling out the submission form, these errors will be present in the table of contents listing for the publish ahead of print versions. This is the case for articles published early, directly out of peer review system, and at the copy editing and paging stages. Another thing to keep in mind that you may consider a drawback is the fact that what is posted online is a document that is formatted for peer review. Formatting for peer review may differ greatly from the paged article. For instance, tables and figures may follow the references for peer review, but will follow the in-text citations in the paged article. Additionally, some peer review systems will insert a title page into the merged PDF that contains information extracted from the submission form, such as the title, author names, article type, abstract, and keywords. Below is an example from the Journal of Oral Implantology. If the publish ahead of print version is posted in an automated process from the peer review system, the title page will remain in the PDF and will be visible to anyone who downloads the article. Should you choose to post your articles ahead of print at the first proof stage, there may be some challenges. The first challenge is that the version of the article posted online will not have any author corrections incorporated. This first proof version is the same version that the authors will be reviewing, but online posting will occur before the author's corrections have been made to the proofs. You may find that authors are unhappy with the article being posted without their corrections incorporated, especially if those corrections are many. Authors should be reminded that when the final version of the article is published in an issue, the publish ahead of print version will be replaced with the final version and any errors will no longer be present. Another challenge is that the proof may have some paging errors. Likewise with grammar errors being in the raw manuscript that is posted online ahead of print, articles posted at the first proof stage could have paging errors such as incorrect figure sizes, wrong internal heading styles, or tables that are not formatted correctly. It is also possible that the copy editor missed a thing or two, so be aware that minor grammar or language errors may be present in the first proof that is posted online. Authors will invariably find errors in the publish ahead of print version of their articles. In my experience, a good portion of the errors are in the online table of contents, which, as mentioned earlier, is derived from the article metadata. It could be that the author made a typo when filling out the submission form for peer review, or there could be errors in the article itself. So what to do when errors are found after online publication? Consider creating a policy regarding corrections made after online publication ahead of print. Do you want to allow authors to make corrections, or is the version that, po that is posted static until it is replaced with the final published version? Authors may be insistent on making corrections, especially since the publish ahead of print version is indexed. Having a firm policy may help when confronted with an unhappy author. But something to be aware of when creating a policy is whether your online vendor allows multiple postings of an article. It is possible that the online platform does not allow changes multiple times to a posting. Contact your account representative and find out what your vendor's policy is. If your online vendor allows corrections to be made to the publish ahead of print version, it's possible that there is a fee associated with reposting an article. That could be, could be nominal or it could be significant. Decide whether the fee is worth the trouble. What kind of corrections does the author want to make? Are the changes significant and worth paying the fee? You will also need to decide if the journal is going to foot the bill or ask the author to pay. Any discussion of publishing ahead of print would not be complete without mention of preprint repositories. One way that authors can disseminate their research as soon as a paper is written is by depositing the paper on a preprint server. The idea is that authors submit their completed papers to the preprint repository prior to submission to a journal for peer review. The paper is assigned a perpetual DOI and is registered in CrossRef. Readers can make comments on the paper and authors have the ability to revise submissions when needed. In the meantime, the author can submit the paper for review to any journal. If the paper is accepted, the published version is linked on the paper's preprint page. There are a few preprint repositories options available to authors. A few examples are Archive, BioArchive, PeerJ Preprints, and Preprints.org. 
Archive was launched in 1991 and is for papers in the fields of physics, mathematics, computer science, quantitative biology, quantitative finance, and statistics. BioArchive was launched in 2013 and is for biology papers. PeerJ Preprints was also launched in 2013 and is for papers in the biological and medical sciences. And preprints.org is a multidisciplinary repository launched just last year. Many journals have a strict policy that an article submitted for review must not have been published elsewhere or posted online previously. However, as acceptance of preprint servers is growing, more journals are okay with authors submitting articles that have been posted to preprint repositories. If your journal does not already have a policy regarding preprints, it's a good idea to consider whether you would be okay with an author submitting an article for review that has been posted as a preprint. There are arguments for and against so decide what is best for your journal and make it part of your general journal policies. Next up, I'm going to discuss ways of possibly speeding up the production of your journal. Every vendor or contractor you use should be able to provide you with a standard schedule for how long you can expect their processes to take from submission of materials to delivery of completed files. For journals that publish on a regular basis, a production schedule is most likely to cover a whole year of issues. The next year's schedule should be provided to you prior to the date when materials for the first issue of the next year are due. For many journals, that would be sometime in September or October. If the publication of your journal varies from one issue to another, and there is no set publishing schedule from one volume to the next, request a schedule from your vendor prior to submission of materials for each issue. Be sure to review this schedule very carefully. The schedule should contain not only dates for each stage of production, but also the number of days that each stage needs. Sit down with the calendar and count the days. Confirm the dates on the schedule. You'll need to know if your vendor includes weekends or just business days and what holidays they take. Make sure that what you are agreeing to meets your expectations and work with your account representative if it does not. It's important to hold up your end of the bargain, so keep to your dates. While some vendors can make up lost days, some are not able to. Depending on the way they schedule staff and equipment, your work may be put at the end of a queue if materials are submitted past your due date. Make sure you know what their policies are in case you miss a date for unforeseen reasons, but do your best to make your deadlines. Sending your work to a vendor can feel like dropping it into a black hole while you wait for your files to be returned. Your account representative is your connection to your work as it travels through the production processes. Make sure you keep in contact with your rep or the contractor if you're using one for updates on progress. Asking for regular updates could alert you to potential issues, giving you the opportunity to help resolve them before delays occur. Say you have a special issue coming up and the printed books need to be finished in time to arrive at your annual meeting. Let your vendor know as soon as, er as, as early as possible that you have this special situation coming up. If necessary, ask for shorter turnaround times. The vendor may not be able to accommodate the request, but you might be surprised. Things change. Technology improves. It's a good idea to review your production processes every couple of years. If you find that you are editing articles after acceptance and before final disposition is set, then sending them off to your copy editor, then doing a copy at a little level proofread, you're probably spending more time than is necessary to edit your articles. Make sure you're happy with the copy editor's work quality so that you can try to pare down to one copy editing pass. Multiple rounds of copy editing can add days or even weeks to a production schedule. I have found that in the last 10 years, more and more of my customers view proofs only once or twice during the production process, and I can confidently say that quality has not suffered. If you are reviewing proofs three or four times, it might be time to reduce that number. The more time you spend reviewing proofs, the longer it takes for your content to be published. Consider having a discussion with your account representative about the technology your vendor uses to produce your work. Their company may have new offerings that might help speed up the time production takes. Also, it's a good idea to keep abreast of advances in technology and scholarly publishing. If you read about something that piques your interest, talk to your account rep about how they can help you with any new publishing initiatives that you're thinking of implementing. 
As an editor, it pains me to ask this, but is perfection really possible in publishing? As editors, we're trying to find mistakes. There's always something here or there that could be tweaked. But just by letting go, you save yourself not only time in your production schedule, but also stress. Be comfortable with your production processes and confident that your schedule, that your content is scientifically accurate, readable, and pleasing to the eye. But don't sweat the small stuff. Journal offices come in many different sizes, from just a couple of employees to dozens. Regardless of your editorial office size, it's a good idea to think about the amount of staff you have compared to the day-to-day -day tasks of keeping your journal running. It is possible you need additional staff to help. Evaluate the time that the current staff members spend on each task. If they are unsure of what duties take the most time, have them do a task tracker for a day or two. This involves having the employee stop what they are doing every 15 minutes and record what he or she is doing at the moment. This can be pretty enlightening regarding what tasks are the most time consuming. In any case, if you know that papers are sitting, waiting for action because of lack of time on the part of the staff members, it may be time to add staff. As a journal grows, the staff should grow with it. If you're not able to hire a full-time staff person, consider hiring a part-timer. If you're located on a university campus, find out if you can obtain some student help or outsource some tasks to a contractor if possible. Every little bit of extra capacity helps in keeping the peer review and production processes running smoothly and on time. Finally, one option to consider is whether a vendor could help with the daily tasks of running your journal. Having an editorial assistant, production editor, or managing editor to rely on to shepherd submissions through review and accepted papers through production can free up time for the in-house staff and can go a long way to keeping your journal publishing on time or even ahead of schedule. I have been managing editor for over 11 years and have successfully managed the peer review and production workflows for journals that had problems keeping their issues running smoothly and on time prior to coming to Allen Press. So consider obtaining a vendor assistance. I will now turn the presentation back over to Kristen for a discussion about continuous publication. Thank you, Beverly. You know, I think sometimes we see our production schedules, and for authors especially, as a game of red light, green light. So for the author, he sees the acceptance, and yay, great news, let's go. Nope, let's not. It needs to get into copy editing. Sometimes authors will see this copy edited file, so movement again. Okay, good. So the author, yes, he likes this. Then stop, typesetting layout. Oh wait, if I'm the author, I see this version when it's done. Okay, typesetting is done. Let's go again. Oh wait, I have corrections. Let's stop and get this edited. Back to layout and so on. You get the picture. It can feel almost as if you're stopped in traffic and the published end is nowhere in sight. For some of those quarterly or bi-monthly publications, the end may not be for a while, depending on time of acceptance. But for our continuous publication model, movement can be constant to where content in its final form can be posted. Those vehicles you see on your screen, those can be articles. I copy this Clover concept to production and show that while the red light, green light concept can continue just a bit, entire content of an issue is not held up. Articles can get volume issue assignment and page numbers, and then post online when ready. So let's take a closer look at this model. The file gets prepped, say, coming from copy edit and layout. So maybe that's articles number three and six. They are just starting out the process. The file goes to the author and editor for review. A revision cycle for that particular article, all on its own, occurs. So that is illustrated here with articles number two, four, five, and seven. Maybe it occurs again. So you'll see on the blue revision circle arrows. These arrows indicate there could be multiple revisions of one article. So do we have an article number one? Yep, sure do. But I didn't show it here because it's already in that green publish road. It has volume issue assignment and page numbers are included. We're not viewing it anymore and it is not held up by those other six articles that are in various stages of production. And it is final. Unlike the preprint we heard about, it is final, it's the final edited, paged in all its glory version. So what does this mean for a journal? You have content continually moving all the time. And all the time, content is moving. 
A mail date, for instance, isn't holding up your content. You have articles continually posting when ready. For journals that do not print, you may want to reconsider why you are holding up for publication of an entire issue, and is it necessary? Again, you are online only already. You may want to simply start publishing articles when ready. But going back to journals that print, or actually any journal really, organized in a particular way, some careful planning might be given as you plan for what the table of contents looks like. Ideally, you may want all page numbering to be consecutive, which can be difficult when your table of contents is organized by article type. One option to consider if you like having the categories still is to keep the table of contents in article type categories, and then under each category, have the articles listed in numerical order within each section. So I think this might be better explained with the following example. This isn't the entire table of contents, but you'll see the article types research papers, research note, and reviews. Notice that the one research note is on page 1489. But then in looking at the information above, the research paper grouping jumps over that. So if you look at 1478, that jumps to 1496. But you're still maintaining the presence of article type grouping. So what does this workflow mean for the author? <clears throat> the waiting game of when is my article going to be final? When is my article going to, pe going to appear? And hey, I have this other paper that cites this particular article. When are the page numbers assigned? All of that is gone. As quickly as the individual article can move through editorial feedback, typesetting corrections, and into online publishing, those are the only basic holdups. And what does this mean for the reader? Content is continually posted in keeping your readers interested. And I think just in general, you're drawing more traffic, well, positive traffic, to your online platform with this option. As a result of readers accessing your content, what other, other, excuse me, what other important items are going to catch their eye? Depending on how much content we're talking about, you could have postings every week. Viewers aren't waiting for the months of, say, March, June, September, and December for content. They are viewing it throughout the year. At Allen Press, we've been able to work with these workflows, as well as witness some of these trans transitions. I wish I had additional time to share more of our publications during this talk, but I just wanted to speak to a couple journals as examples. For instance, for a smaller publication like the Journal of Agriculture and Urban Entomology, so by small, um, I mean 10 to 15 articles per year, and it's a publication without restrictions on the number of issues or articles to be included in each volume. Their continuous publication model works really well. The editor said this process really saves him grief and trouble. He went on to say, I do not have to make sure that a certain number of articles are accepted within a specific period of time. This can be a very stressful aspect of an editor's job when submissions are low and inconsistent through time. The articles can be published quickly and on time, which the authors really appreciate. Two journals under the American Orthological Society first considered switching to a preprint workflow, but decided against that route because they were concerned with citation records. Their articles publish on one day each week, 52 weeks a year, although in some weeks we'll see one or both journals may not have an article. The journal's director also said they do press releases on some of these articles, and so since we're talking about it being the final version published as soon as it can be, that press release can go right, right away and be accurate. One specific journal that started this workflow migration in December 2016 was the Journal of Food Protection. Internal account manager of the journal has already seen the upside and said we have posted articles four weeks earlier than the traditional full issue method. Authors of this journal as well as the executive board, along with the journal management committee, which I may sideline with is made up of authors mostly, played a significant role in moving to this option. The feeling among the group is certainly positive, and this is something that the administrative editor witnessed in the summer committee meeting. And she said the continuous publication platform will continue, and remarks that down the road, we hope this increases our impact factor. The sooner an article can be cited, the better use for citations. Four weeks earlier than the printed version, that is certainly a huge advantage to getting science out there to the community. Continuous publication models certainly have their benefits. Think continuous movement, not stop and go. You can still frame your table of contents as desired, 
And just think how happier your authors will be with volume and issue assignment in place and the traffic that is continually drawn to your site. This just about concludes our presentation. Again, a brief summary. <clears throat> I spoke to peer review, ensuring we communicate effectively and set expectations. I also spoke to education programs for reviewers and editors and running through your author instructions for clarity. And it wouldn't hurt to reassess your editorial turnaround times on a yearly basis. I covered Publish Ahead of Print as a way of speeding up the publishing of your content. From posting content directly from the peer review system after acceptance to posting copy edited and paged files, there are options available at many stages of production, each with its own set of benefits and challenges. I also talked about options for speeding up production of your journal, evaluating the production processes themselves, adhering to a production schedule, and considering your staffing options could help in getting your content published faster. And then I wrapped us up with the continuous publication platform and trying to have less stop and go and think continuous posting of finalized content. In closing, we want to thank our colleagues and customers for providing support along the way. And we want to thank all you listeners for joining us. Your time is appreciated. Now I'm going to turn the mic back to Taylor. Thank you so much, Beverly and Kristen. <clears throat> We do have a few questions from the audience. Um, so I'll start with what policy guidelines or recommendations do you have for preprint repositories? I think this depends on the type of science that you're publishing. If it is uh, something that is really time sensitive and your authors are concerned about having their research published as quickly as possible after a study is finished, then you might consider allowing um, articles that are submitted for your journal to review um, to have authors post those articles as preprints. Um, you might find that you're pushed in that direction by your author base anyway. Um, if you um, find that authors are asking a lot about that or that you're finding that you're turning away authors because they have posted their articles um, on a preprint server, then it might be time to consider whether or not uh, you want to allow authors to do so. Great, thanks Beverly. Second question we have, my peer review workflow is slowed down by our busy volunteer editors and reviewers. How do I ask them to speed up the pace? Uh, good question. Um, I think what I have to think about is um, asking reviewers to note their unavailability. Most uh, peer review sites have a space uh, in their profile where you can note this, and then it's posted, say, when you're inviting reviewers. It can show up for that particular reviewer. Otherwise, I think, you know, just a friendly reminder again about your expectations to your staff, um, because you might be surprised at what they say in response. Um, is there an underlying issue going on, either about the site itself or maybe about, you know, the people involved? And, um, you know, in, in thinking of time, maybe the actual review form needs some updates or maybe something um, could be taken out or added in. Um, I think those three things might be, might be ways to do that. I don't know, Beverly, do you have? Uh, one other thing you could do is to um, send all of your reviewers that have completed reviews a survey um, just to see whether they think the time that they've been given to review papers for your journal is too long or too short, although I suppose nobody's going to think it's too long. But um, you could ask, you know, just do a really simple survey, send it out to all the reviewers that have completed reviews and say, you know, hey, we're thinking of changing the review time from this to this. Is that, does that sound logical to you or would that be too little time to complete? And a final question, going back to preprints, uh, question is, can preprints be cited? Yes, they can. Um, the fact that they're indexed in, uh, particularly in PubMed, um, means that they, they can be cited. I think that there's probably some journals out there that have individual style preferences when it comes to citing that sort of thing. Um, I'm specifically thinking about uh, some journals that, that, like, for instance, don't allow um, citation of personal communication or personal observations. Um, but that's a style preference for them, um, probably based in, in science, um, you know, their personal science. But um, in general, yes, they are citable. They have a DOI, they're indexed um, in PubMed, they have uh, the register with Crossref, so yeah, they should be citable. Uh, one of our audience members wants to know, 
where can I find good freelancers or contractors within scholarly publishing? There are a few options. Um, for freelance copy editing, um, I would recommend going to the websites for the Editorial Freelancers Association. Um, a lot of freelancers will post their resumes there, and I believe that you can even um, pick a person and like send in a bid for work, um, and they can you can uh, communicate through the system. There's also the European Association of Science Editors and the Board of Editors in the Life Sciences. Both of them have uh, job boards that you can look for uh, freelancers. If you're looking for um, production help or peer review help um, in the form of a managing editor, or editorial assistant, or production editor, um, the ISMTE, CFC, and SSP uh, websites all have job boards. Um, I would recommend you know, creating a job description and posting a job um, offering on those boards, making clear that the job is a freelance position um, and you're likely to get lots of traffic that way. Very good. There are a few more questions, but we're going we're gonna to go ahead and wrap up today. Um, if we did not answer your question, we will follow up with you after the webinar uh, and we'll be happy to exchange emails. Um, I would like to again thank Beverly and Kristen, as well as everyone who attended the webinar today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that you learned a thing or two about improving the speed of publication. Just a quick reminder that our next webinar will take place Thursday, October 26th, and feature the University of Kansas Dean of Libraries and copyright guru, Kevin Smith. So registration is now open at allenpress.com. And finally, at the conclusion of this webinar, we will be sending out a brief survey that will ask you to rate the presentation, our quality of content, and overall value to your organization. Your input is extremely helpful, so please take a few moments and complete our questionnaire. In addition, if you have any more questions after the survey, feel free to contact me at tfulton at allenpress.com. That concludes our session for today. Thank you again for attending.